welcome. I have the pleasure of introducing Marcy Hamilton, who I've had the honor of knowing for many years. Uh, I think I first learned of you with your book, God vs. the Gavel, and I also, we're, I'm on the advisory board of the Child Friendly Faith Project, and you came and spoke there as well, and we recently met in, 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 in Pennsylvania, and I'm so excited that you have this amazing project, Child USA, and so uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Please say more about it. Do you want to say? So thanks so much uh, for taking the time today. Uh, I am uh, a former law professor at Cardozo Law School in New York, uh, where I specialized in uh, the First Amendment and religious groups that break the law. Uh, that started with a Supreme Court case I had in 19. 97, Bernie v. Flores, in which I persuaded the Supreme Court to hold the Religious Freedom Restoration Act unconstitutional. Um, as a result of that case, uh, I was contacted by those people who uh, lobby against religion all over the United States. And it turned out a predominant number of them were people who work on child welfare and child abuse issues. So in 2002, when the spotlight story broke, about abuse in Boston, the issue literally fell in my lap. So I have been working on clergy sex abuse and then child sex abuse and now child abuse and neglect issues since then. Um, child USA is uh, an organization that is a think tank to prevent child abuse and neglect through research that's then provided to lawmakers so that they'll make better laws. Uh, and it's based in my a firm belief that it's not enough for the victims of abuse and neglect to tell their stories. It's never enough. Uh, the only way for us to persuade lawmakers is to have hard data, and so that's what we work on. So one of the issues that I have spent a lot of time on is the statute of limitations for child sex abuse. And the reason for that is that when I was recruited to work as the First Amendment expert in a lot of the clergy sex abuse cases, I would be very surprised that there would be only one client, but there would be eight victims. And I would say, how is it that you're only suing on behalf of one of the victims and the eight other victims are over there? And the answer was always the statute of limitations, always. The vast majority of child sex abuse victims, by the time they're ready to come forward, are incapable uh, any earlier, and therefore they miss the statute of limitations. So um, this became a passion for me, and I now have worked on this issue in every state where there's been major reform over the last uh, 18 years, um, and continue to work on it. Um, so uh, the most activity right now is in Pennsylvania following the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report on sex abuse in six dioceses with 300 <coughs> priests and 1,000 victims. So we have, um, we're, in, we're in the throes of, of the fight. So, um, yeah. So, I shouldn't look at that, I should look at that. Um, so this is the book that I wrote about statutes of limitations. It's the only book about child sex abuse statutes of limitations. And the basic premise is this. The trauma that occurs to children as a result of sex abuse the disproportionate power between the child and the perpetrator, and the likelihood that the child is pressured to remain silent create a likelihood that a victim of child sex abuse will not come forward until adulthood. And in fact, the best study to date shows the average age, and I'll show this in a minute, but the average age of coming forward for child sex abuse is 52. A third of victims come forward during childhood, a third never come forward, and a third come forward in between 18 and death. So the, the problem for the law is what do you do about someone who has been sexually abused but they're incapable of bringing the lawsuit or pressing charges until many years later? Uh, for most states, the law was, about uh, 20 years ago, two years from the date of the event. So a six-year-old had until age eight to press charges or to sue for damages. Virtually impossible. Uh, and since most abuse occurs 
at the hands of family members or close family associates, that child is trapped, right? That child needs a roof, they need food, they need education, they need clothing, they keep it secret. And so the primary problem with child sex abuse in the United States is the secrecy that surrounds it that is reinforced by a patriarchal culture and a legal system that keeps the victims silent. Uh, if the victim wants to come forward earlier, they're punished. And the way that they're punished, we saw with, with uh, for example, Bill Cosby. Uh, now, only one of his victims was underage, but this is an example of what perpetrators do. When the first several women came public and it became a big story, he sued them for defamation, if you remember. Right? It was his reputation being sullied by people who said that he had sexually assaulted them. The way that our system works, you can't defend yourself against a defamation claim unless you hire a lawyer and it's expensive. And so if you want to talk about your abuser before you can be in court, you run the risk of being sued for defamation. And what a lawyer will tell you is unless you're wealthy, don't do it don't disclose because you don't want to be sued because you can't afford to be sued. So the legal system between the statute of limitations, the defamation laws, and other parts of our culture that aren't doing right by kids means that we have a huge number of adult victims of child sex abuse who have never been helped. So the project right now is threefold. It's what do we do with the criminal statutes of limitations? What do we do with the civil statutes of limitations? And what do we do with all those victims who, for them, both have expired? And they're, all re they're simply out of luck. So, so uh, we, is that the next slide? It's number three. OK, all right. Um, so. Essentially what Child USA has been doing has been tracking all 50 states. So on our website, childusa.org, on the law page, we have all 50 states. We are the only organization that tracks it daily. These things are changing very, very quickly. Um, but we also have just completed a study of what's happened with access to justice for child sex abuse victims since 2002. Why 2002? Because that's the date of the spotlight report about cover-up, and it's the cover-up that spurred the legal changes. Uh, we have just released this report, and on the one hand, we're ranking all of the states, and on the other hand, we are um, tracking how much activity has there been in the law. So what this is, is this is showing you that with respect to the civil statute of limitations, the leading two states in the United States are Delaware and Minnesota. The worst states are Alabama, Mississippi, and New York. Uh, and New York is in part because of the extraordinary power of the Catholic bishops to keep the statutes of limitations where they are and not to let them move. Um, you'll notice that Massachusetts is in the middle. Uh, Massachusetts is in the middle because uh, O'Malley cut a deal with lawmakers here in Massachusetts recently, and uh, we got a change, but it was a change that was very favorable to the church. So victims are in a better place in Massachusetts than they used to be, but they're not in a, in a great place. Next one. So Massachusetts would be under three. Yeah. That's where it is. Yeah. So in terms of criminal law, which is, so what you just saw is that for the civil statutes of limitations, most states have not eliminated the civil statute of limitations, but the, the age is about 30 to 50 years old. There might be a discovery rule. For criminal, we have a lot more uniformity. What this shows you is that the vast majority of the states, and that's ranking four and five, have at least eliminated the criminal statute of limitations for child sex abuse completely. So four are all the states that have eliminated it for the felonies. So for the top counts in those states, a child will be able to bring a claim up until death. And so you can have a six-year-old, for example, who's brought in, they do a rape kit, and that rape kit could be evidence for the duration of their lives. 
So one of the projects the child is working on, which will be the subject of a big report by CNN in a month, uh, is what happens with children's rape kits? Yes. And the answer is they get destroyed. And nobody explains it, and there aren't procedures, and so we're working on better procedures to try to preserve these kits as we get rid of the statute of limitations. But what you see in four and five here are states, for the most part, that changed their criminal statute of limitations relatively recently. For about 10 states, they never did have one. Wyoming has never had a statute of limitations for crimes, oddly enough. Uh, but other states have only recently changed the statute of limitations for the criminal side of it, which means that even though this looks like tremendous progress, for a lot of adults, they are still outside of the criminal statute of limitations. They don't have any options. So the question is, what do you do about these particular victims? So we'll go to the next thing. So this is all the states overall. Um, and this is including the civil rankings with respect to whether or not the state has done anything for the past victims. And here's what you do for the victims from the past. You revive their expired civil statute of limitations. So. In 2003, California tried to revive both criminal and civil statutes of limitations. They tried to restore justice to the victims of sex abuse in both arenas. The United States Supreme Court in Stogner v. California at the end of 2003 ruled that it's unconstitutional to revive the criminal statute of limitations. The ex post facto clause prevents it. So that means the only thing you can do for a victim whose SOLs have expired is to revive their expired civil statutes of limitations. So the only thing you can do is give them the right to sue the institution or the perpetrator. You don't have any other options. And so we have two sets of victims right now in the United States. We have the ones that have been shut out of the system which are millions of adults. The only thing we can do for them is to revive the expired civil. And then we have the children and those who are not yet out of the statute of limitations. And they are the ones that really we're working on complete elimination. They are the ones that the argument is, well, you just completely eliminate the civil and criminal. And so going forward, they'll be able to have the benefit. They, they will come forward when they're ready rather than either rushing when they're not ready and sacrificing their mental health or their family. Um, but the, what this shows you is that most of the states are in the middle of the movement, that they are moving toward greater justice for child sex abuse victims, but there's still quite a lot of work to do. Um, at this point, only nine states have revived expired civil statutes of limitations. Only nine states have dealt with the challenges that are posed from the victims from the past. Massachusetts was in this Is that right? I didn't think so. Yeah, they should have been. They should have been right in the middle. In the middle column. Yeah. Did we leave it out? You left us no. out. Oh, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> no, I'm You're right in the middle. I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, so going back to um, this one. So, so the question is whether or not the um, revelations about clergy sex abuse cover up in 2002 in the Boston Archdiocese, which then of course spread to every diocese in the United States and now every diocese in the world, whether or not that is being met with legal reform. And so the question we asked is, how many states have altered their child sex abuse statutes of limitations since 2002? And that's what this chart tells you. In uh, 2017, we had five states make significant changes. But there was no year where the states were not considering changes. And what this shows you is enactment. It doesn't show you introduction. And so most years we've had at least 15 states, including this year, considering, lengthening, eliminating, or reviving the statutes of limitations for child sex abuse. This is a, a really active movement. 
it's being driven by the survivors and it's being driven by uh, lawyers who are uh, very interested, of course, in one, making money, but two, getting the stories out there. Uh, yes? So, but you're saying it's all civil because they can't be criminal because that's been stuck. Well, I'll show the criminal, I've got a criminal chart too. Yeah, no, we did, there's been a lot of movement on criminal as well. Um, but on the civil side, the movement has been spurred in part by the civil lawsuits. And the reason for that, and Timothy Litton at Albany Law did a great book on holding the bishops accountable. The, and I think he's right. He says his argument is the only reason we know what we do about clergy sex abuse in the United States is due to civil lawsuits. Because the civil lawsuits generate discovery and they generate facts that you cannot get any other way. Uh, whereas criminal prosecution rarely occurs in child sex abuse. It's a tiny percentage of child sex abuse cases are actually prosecuted. Prosecutors don't like cases they're going to lose. And it's very hard to have a child successfully testify, especially if they're under a certain age. And it's very, very hard to prove it because it usually happens in secret with no witnesses. So we have very little criminal prosecution the civil cases are where we're learning what we're learning. But just to give you an example of an understanding of where the, where the facts are, if, have any of you looked at the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report on six dioceses? So it's monumental. It's 886 pages. It has three, over 300 priests are named. Over 1,000 victims are, were interviewed. And it is spearheading the change in the law in the state of Pennsylvania as we speak. Uh, but it's 886 pages. It is literally just a set of lists. It's lists of dioceses, lists of locations, lists of priests. That's it. And you might get a paragraph or two about each victim that, the, that they can talk about. But if you were to file a civil lawsuit, you would end up with thousands of pages on one case. So when the settlements occurred with the Los Angeles Archdiocese about 10 years ago, uh, this was after they opened, they, they revived the expired statutes of limitations during 2003. There were about 850 Catholic victims that came forward, about 500 of them in the Los Angeles Archdiocese. The deal they cut, because they were able to bring these civil lawsuits, was they had to release documents alongside a, uh, I think it was a $550 million settlement. It was about $1.3 million per victim. They released hundreds of thousands of pages of documents that showed you the pattern, what happened. It showed you the perpetrators nobody had named yet. It showed you that there were victims nobody had thought of. It showed you locations, volunteers. So what the civil lawsuits do is they produce facts for the public that they cannot get otherwise. And in particular, they can't get them from the Catholic Church because of the secret archives. They can't get them from the Jehovah's Witnesses because of the rule of secrecy among the Jehovah's Witnesses. They can't get it from the Boy Scouts, right? None of these facts that we now know about seriatim child sex abuse would have come out without the civil lawsuits. Criminal prosecution is one person charging one person, and it doesn't get you the facts about the system, the systemic abuse, that is what is really the problem right now, the, the, the epidemic we have. So the next. So this is state criminal. So there was more activity on the criminal side of it. It's been easier for lawmakers to say, yeah, get rid of the, the criminal statutes of limitations. Uh, largely because the primary lobbyists against the victims are the Insurance Federation and the Catholic bishops. Both sink millions in each state into trying to block the changes, but they can't say publicly that they don't want the criminal statute of limitations extended because they say they're the gold standard now on child protection. So if they're now so protective of children, why would they have any concerns about the criminal statute being extended? So they, had, they started blocking all civil, criminal extension, and revivals. They've now been cornered 
and they're only fighting, but they're fighting tooth and nail against reviving the expired civil statutes of limitations. Uh, and that's because they don't want the secret archives published. And the, and the Insurance Federation does not want to pay on the claims it's collected for decades in circumstances where the victims weren't coming forward. It was a really great business model. And so all of these institutions were covered by child sex abuse writers, but very little payment was ever made. So the Philadelphia Archdiocese uh, which I was part of the 2005 team that created the grand jury report that came out in 05, 450 pages, 63 priests, hundreds of victims, and no justice. No one was in the statute of limitations. No one was able to do anything. But we learned that over all the years that the Philadelphia Archdiocese had had hundreds of victims, many of them coming in to the Archdiocese to ask for help and other things, the Archdiocese had paid a total of $200,000, total. And this was looked upon by Cardinal Bevelock as one of the shining stars of his career, that he had kept victims both from disclosing their abuse and also from uh, being able to collect for the damages that were done to them. Who is this? Cardinal Bevelock. Oh, oh yeah. okay. He was, very, he was a very powerful, Cardinal in the United States, in part because he was both a civil lawyer and a canon lawyer. And he ran the archdiocese like a good lawyer would do. Uh, and so, uh, so they, they virtually never had to pay anything. Now, part of what's going on in the Catholic Church, but it's not different from many religious organizations that have similar principles. But in 1964, the Vatican issued a document it was a document that required secrecy on the part of all members of the church, both clergy and lay people, with respect to three categories. Priests who had had sex with animals, priests who had had sex with children, and priests who had had sex with other priests, homosexuality. For those three categories, the penalty in the 1964 document for disclosure to anybody was excommunication. So priests were directly told that if they told someone else about the fact that the priest down the hall was bringing boys into his room, they would be excommunicated. But the victims that came forward until very recently were told they would be excommunicated if they told anybody. And so the, the system was created to keep a tight lid on an issue that they were largely expert in. Nobody knew more about the recidivism of perpetrators against children than the Catholic Church, and it was all secretly documented and kept by canon law in secret archives, which to this day are in the offices of every diocese in the United States. The vast majority have not been released, even Pennsylvania, which has had the most grand jury investigations of any state in the country. There have been nine investigations, two of the public schools, one of six dioceses, three of the Philadelphia Archdiocese, one of the Solberry School, a boarding school, a very uh, elite boarding school in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and another one of Johnstown Altoona Diocese. Not, there's no one knows more about systemic child abuse than Pennsylvania because these grand jury reports in other states even close. Um, but at the same time, all the secret archives are still not fully disclosed. They're still they're still hidden away. Yes. How, how much time? Uh, can we have questions in for sir? I'm sorry. Yeah, the question is how much an hour later? I suggest later. Okay. So you can see very active uh, with respect to the criminal statute of limitations, even more than with respect to the civil. So the next one I think is just combined, which we could just, yeah. That's it. Um, so this just shows you there's been a lot of activity, um, which is unusual, right? It, it, to get lawmakers, oh, oh, oh this is, great. Sorry. So let's move. Uh, Forward? Yeah. So. Okay, so here is the map of the United States showing you where the states have eliminated the criminal statute of limitations, where they've eliminated the civil statute of limitations, and where they've revived expired. 
So the plain blue is elimination of the criminal. The stripes show you that they also eliminated the civil statute of limitations, and the stars are where they have revived the expired civil statutes of limitations. So you can see just visually that there's been a lot more movement on the criminal side than there has been on the civil side. But as I said, there are so few cases prosecuted for child sex abuse that it shows that we just have a lot more to do. Um, what the civil lawsuits do is they shift the cost of the abuse from the victim to the ones who caused it. So over the course of a lifetime, uh, according to the CDC, it's about $210,000 cost of the abuse for the victim. Uh, but other studies have shown that it, uh, therapy that's provided and needed by one victim may well exceed a million dollars over the course of a lifetime, just because of the needs. So, okay, so next. So, the question is, if, if the answer for the victims from the past, we've got millions of victims, how, what happens when you open up the civil statutes of limitations and of course, the usual argument is that if the sky will fall, it will be the end of the world because now you have millions of victims and they're all going to sue at once and institutions will go bankrupt and the end of the world. What this shows you is that in fact, the numbers have been pretty modest. So let me start with California. There were 1,150 victims that came forward in 2003. Among those victims, 850 were Catholic. 300 were explorer scouts, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, family members, a mix, Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, that out of a state of 35 million people. So with one in four girls that have been sexually abused and one in six boys, 1150 out of 35 million is a very small number in the end. But that same year, as a result of the lawsuit, 300 perpetrators were identified that had never been identified before. That's what the lawsuits do, is they bring to the fore, forefront who the perpetrators are that have been taking advantage of the statutes of limitations. Now you might think it's odd that Delaware would have more than California, a tiny little Delaware. Um, but in fact, what happened in Delaware when they opened the statute from 2007 to 2009 is that 175 came forward against public school teachers and priests. A thousand came forward against Dr. Earl Bradley. He is the most prolific pedophile pediatrician in the history of the United States. He had set up a practice where his waiting room was like Disney for everybody. There was a place for the kids and a place for the adults. Great computers for the adults. He would take the kids by himself, go back, he would abuse every single one of them, and then you bring the kid back out to the adult, tell the kid don't tell anybody ever, this is between us, and abuse for decades. It took the opening of the statute of limitations for the first victim to become public. Once they did, the others started lining up. So Delaware is distinctive, uh, not because it's a higher percentage per capita, but because one of the perpetrators was, at, was so incredibly prolific. Minnesota, about, a thousand victims came forward. The, the window just closed in 2016, uh, and about 800 were against the Catholic Church. Uh, a number were against a theater school in Minneapolis, uh, and others were against uh, other religious organizations, but also the Boy Scouts. Hawaii is interesting because Hawaii has uh, been the most progressive in the United States with respect to revivals. They revived their statute civil for two years, and then they, the, the, the island did not fall into the sea, and so they revived it for another two years, and then it didn't fall into the sea again, and in fact, on, in the second two years, victims from a school for the disabled came forward, um, and these were autistic boys who had been sexually abused by a number of uh, the workers at a school, and so they just added another two years. And so Hawaii, in the end, will have a six-year window where there will be six years of opportunity for a victim to sue, even if their uh, claims have otherwise expired. The other interesting um, perpetrator that we learned about in Hawaii was a man by the name of Jay Ram. Jay Ram's adult children called me pretty soon after the window was opened to say, we would like to sue our father. 
And I said, okay, um, tell me what happened. So this is what happened. Jay Brown was a very, very wealthy man who owned a plantation on the, in the state of Hawaii. He would get foster children from California. He would bring them to his plantation. He would have them work the plantation. He would not educate them. He would adopt them. All of their names were changed to Ram as their last name, and he would sexually assault them. So he created a system out of the foster care system in order to adopt children and adopted many, many boys. Uh, they also only came forward because the statute of limitations was opened. And once the first child came, uh, once the first brother came forward, they all started to line up. Uh, now Georgia and Utah are, are small. Why? Because Georgia and Utah are primarily controlled by Republicans and so they didn't pass a window that works against institutions. They passed a window where you can only sue the perpetrator. And in the state of Georgia, I need to update this, it's now up to 14 lawsuits, uh, even though we know about many, many more uh, examples. And in Utah, only one person has sued uh, as a result of opening up the statute of limitations against the perpetrator. Uh, and uh, I, wor I work on all of those laws. And I can tell you in Utah, the Mormon church is not going to let that open. It's just not going to happen anytime soon. So, next. So, delayed disclosure. So, the median age to report is 48, but the average age is 52. And that's based on a study of clergy sex abuse victims coming out of Germany. It's a very a long, longitudinal study, very well done. Um, so, what we end up with is that if you're uh, uh, statute of limitations is is not 52 you aren't even at the average and so I told you about Massachusetts so Massachusetts amended its civil statute of limitations to reach age 53 so it's one year past the average it's retroactive but it caps out at 53 uh, and the reason for that is they did the their actuarials that for the um, Catholic Church did their numbers and they figured most of the victims they were most worried about would not be able to come in uh, at this point. Uh, so uh, the state of Pennsylvania is one of the few that has not yet eliminated the criminal statute of limitations. The criminal statute of limitations in Pennsylvania is just 50. That's why out of a thousand victims in the most recent grand jury report, there were only two prosecutions out of the entire report. Uh, and it's because if the average age is 52, then you know that the vast majority just hadn't come forward. So the, the project that we're working on is to eliminate the statutes and limitations backwards and forwards. From the last chart you saw that I had Guam, right? I mean, how odd that anybody would have Guam uh, on this issue. They're the leaders in the world, believe it or not. What happened in Guam is they passed a window about five years ago. Not one person sued, not one. They passed the window because the president of the Senate was sexually assaulted by a priest when he was a child in California. Nobody came forward. He couldn't because his abuse happened in California. So they went back to the drawing board and they simply wrote the statute of limitations out of the law books. There is no statute of limitations backwards or forwards, criminal or civil in, in Guam at this point. And the result is that we have about 250 victims that have come forward, many against the bishop there and a number against a Boy Scout leader. So uh, no one, the bishop was quite powerful and very active and the Vatican did nothing about the bishop until well over 100 victims came forward against him. So what we're dealing with here is public education, public awareness, and when you know that pedophiles can abuse into their elderly years, like John Gagan here, who's in his 80s when he was finally stopped, uh, even the 50-year-old that comes forward might stop child abuse of a future child. Uh, so it's worthwhile to open up the statutes. And so that's why we're spending so much time and effort on these issues. So. That's it. So happy to answer questions. Yeah. <laughs>
didn't say is that I was pro se in the Ninth Circuit whistleblowing the VA case and the appeal said that I was whistleblowing. Michael Lamb, coincidentally, was an attorney who helped me. That's interesting. Yeah. It's a small world. In immigration, where I do work looking at survivors applying for asylum, there seems to be, again, with the advisor, I'm not a lawyer, there seems to be a whole body of cases that argue that the person didn't come forward because they couldn't because of their impairment, because of their trauma. I don't know whether that is or is not. There aren't. There are very few cases that have yet to take into account the traumatology, and for most of the judges at this point, they're still saying things like a recent Pennsylvania Superior Court that said, the child, this guy was abused when he was 12. He knew he was hurt. He didn't come forward. It's his fault. He didn't come forward with what? And it was his fault as a 12-year-old. When I spoke about complicity and conspiracy, I used the term state actor, and people kind of yelled about what do you mean by that, but I think it's clear enough. The institutions, the powers of authority, the police, the whole system that doesn't do what you would hope it would do. Oh, absolutely. I don't know whether it's relevant to the HLA HART category of law that is somehow consistent with Norman Leffitt, that that really has to be the way to force this. In peer review in this state, hospitals consider it sacrosanct and sealed, although the Department of Public Health can look at any peer review they want to. And I don't know whether that's a wedge to get at the church. I mean, separation of church and state. Well, they may have their hands on it, but what's that got to do with the Constitution? Right. I think the last point is Native Americans, there are lots of other groups that have been abused. Yes. Now, the reservations have been very fertile ground, unfortunately. And I think you make the point that the Bill of Rights are there for those that have money. Well, you know, there is the constitutional side of my work at this point is on explaining and bringing to the fore the increasing constitutional rights of children as persons as opposed to property. Of course, women and children were property of the men for centuries. Only recently, women became non-property and became persons and then voting persons. Children are slowly having rights attached to them through the system. Now, it would be a lot easier, for example, in the horrific separation of families at the borders. If we had the convention, the International Convention on the Rights of the Child ratified in the United States, there are actually rights in there that forbid a country from taking a child away from their parents. But the United States is the only state, the country that has not yet ratified the Convention for the Rights of the Child. So all we have is the United States Constitution and the 14th Amendment, and we have some rights. We have a right to speak in school. We have a right of bodily integrity. There's a right to abortion if, in fact, the parents are abusive. I mean, there are growing rights. But with the accumulation of these rights, they're becoming persons. And as they become persons, then you've got an argument you can attach to it. So that, I think, is where the change in the law is going to make the most difference. But it's going to require overruling cases like Wisconsin v. Yoder, which is the United States Supreme Court saying the Amish can take their children out of school at eighth grade. That, I think, is the worst free exercise case in the United States record. And we're moving toward an argument for being able to overturn that kind of case. If that happens, then it becomes much easier to create rights for children. You're first so impressive what you're doing and your work. And in terms of your last statement, this is obviously not simply a North American or United States phenomenon. What is being done globally, this is an international legal issue. And is there input there? And also, obviously, states are very important here. But what about the government itself? I mean, you can see what happens. You're probably going to have a good case with this fourth person if she chooses to work with you. That would be very interesting to unfold. But 
something that's happening globally, and I'm part of that effort, because their definitions of personhood uh, date much late, earlier than, than ours did as well. So there is a movement internationally for the statute of limitations reform uh, in the countries where there's been major change. I've been asked to provide testimony and advice. Scotland has eliminated theirs. Uh, Australia is you know, a federation. So some of the states of Australia have done something. Um, Chile uh, is remarkable very, very, very quickly, um, in part based on testimony and advising from me uh, in November they're expected to eliminate their statutes. But Australia is really interesting when you ask about the federal government. Um, and, and I do understand frustration with the fact you're dealing with 50 states. As someone who has to study the 50 states every day, wouldn't I love it if the federal government could do this, but they can't. It's federalism. The federal government has statutes of limitations for these kinds of crimes if the child crosses a border, either a state or international boundary. If they don't, if the crime is completely within the state, it's the state's power to, so, and so that's why it's so important to work on the 50 states. But the Australians have done what's called a royal commission, and it is absolutely remarkable. For a number of years, they studied through government-funded commission, using experts coming, coming in from all over the world, what happens in institutions in child sex abuse. They studied not just the Catholic Church, but yeshivas. They uncovered massive abuse in some of the yeshivas in Australia. They studied uh, schools, and they studied uh, extracurricular activity. And Jehovah's Witnesses. And Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, no, many religious groups. Um, and they came out with a report, a massive report, and um, part of what they recommended was eliminate the statute of limitations. And so that has to be taken up state by state, kind of like the United States, and so it's being considered. You know, I, I think they'll have middling success in getting rid of it. But a group, uh, there's a group called the Catholic Whistleblowers. They are mm -hmm. clergy members, nuns and priests, who are intent on helping the victims. And so on their behalf and representing them, I wrote a letter to Obama saying that we need a national commission on institution-based child sex abuse. Uh, and I can tell you that that will never happen at the federal government level. It's just not going to happen. There has not yet been, and I've been tracking it, there's not yet been a member of the Senate, the House, or a president who has yet said the three words clergy sex abuse publicly. They just don't want to talk about it. They are terrified of being in opposition to the Catholic Church uh, and children suffering and the cost to society of this suffering isn't what they're going to be concerned about. So state by state, we're making tremendous progress, but at the federal government, we haven't even yet had hearings. There hasn't been one hearing on institution-based sex abuse in the United States. And it's not because some members haven't wanted it. I mean, Bobby Scott would like to see it. He's been really good on separation of church and state. He's, he thinks this is something that ought to be done, but the members just don't want to be seen publicly as anti-Catholic. Um, is that true? But also, that is true. Now, the what? UN has a committee, and the committee investigated abuse at the Vatican and issued a scathing report, and that was the end of it, because they don't have any enforcement capacity. Yeah. Right. Um, I was struck by uh, the points you made about the, uh, the statutes and uh, was uh, also very disturbed by the way that whole issue was played in a recent nomination to the Supreme Court, which you may be familiar with. Yes. And uh, uh, the question then, of course, is there's intrinsic resistance to not just the church, but the religious right, which spans a fair number of Protestant doctrines as well. Yes. So if you say clergy sex abuse, uh, you are in danger of by, by you know abusing your base and um, being able to. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, th that right. would, at some level, help account for the curious mutism on the subject by high political officials. Right. Yeah. No, it's so, pure politics. I yeah. mean, in in the end, the issues that I work on, much to my chagrin, are almost a hundred percent politics. Yeah. Um, the Republicans tend to resist. Uh, expanding the statutes of limitations. Democrats are much more willing to do it. Sure. 
um, but no one wants to antagonize a religious group. I mean, that's really why I wrote God versus the Gavel, um, and, and especially in the most recent edition. Uh, so it's church and state. It's, it's church. Basically, what I do is I document seven chapters, instances where religious believers and organizations violate the law in different in children and, and marriage and land use and prisons, etc. And I say, look, there are thousands of exemptions from the law for religious believers in the United States, and everybody assumes religious actors always do good. They assume they'll never hurt anybody, and they're never asked. So when the Christian scientists ask for an exemption for medical neglect of their children, the lawmakers don't say, what will happen if your child doesn't get treated for diabetes? They don't ask that question. Instead, they say, you know, it's refreshing not to talk to the insurance federation. I think that we will definitely give you your exemption. And so we have religious exemptions throughout the law that endanger children because they're for religious actors and they're quite dangerous. And so that's that's my project. That's why I'm a member of Americans United. Ah, which, which is a great group. What is, what is it? Ameri Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Sadly. Now, being, being part of a religious group and seeing how it functions and how it sanctions its members uh, has, has been a fascinating thing this now for many, many decades. Uh, I always found it somewhat hypocritical, but it, what it did do is it did censor people and kick them out. Right. But fortunately, in my group, we also turned on the documentation to the legal authorities immediately. That was something I made sure it happened in the 1970s when I first joined, and they were making some adjudication, and I raised my hand along, and I said, this needs to go forward into the courts. It's the only answer. And, uh, there was a mix of pushback. Yeah. I did no, if you don't push the poison out of the system of the institution, it poisons the whole institution. Penn State proves that, right? I mean, it's true. It, it's, that's right. That's right. And that's what's continuing to go on. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the um, civil versus criminal. Once a group has been sued because they're citizens of sexual abuse, um, I imagine even though they've been sued, that doesn't stop them from starting out. Then starting up what? It doesn't stop them. The fact that they've been sued doesn't stop them from continuing to sexual abuse. Well, the question is with respect to the institution, right? And so most of these settlements are two-sided. They are both dollars, but just as importantly to the victims, they are also uh, changes in policy. And so, for example, when the Wilmington Diocese settled with the victims in Delaware, they had to agree to very rigorous changes in their uh, handling of children. So they had to hire experts for training, et cetera, et cetera. I believe, and if I can ever get the insurance companies to stop lobbying against the victims and sit down and listen, I think the insurance industry could put a stop to a lot of this. If they were to do annual child abuse audits for every child serving organization, for every organization that has a child anywhere nearby, and you, if you can't get insurance coverage because you fail your child abuse audit, you're going to fix your system. They're the only ones I think who have the capacity to do that kind of massive private enforcement. Uh, and I, th I think a lot of people are starting to realize, you know, they're the reasons that we wear seat belts. They could also be the reason that we have highly trained individuals and in organizations that know the signs of child abuse and they know the signs of when, when someone is abusing children. So I think the insurance industry has a big role here, that, that the lawsuits are giving us the facts to help us explain why we need a systemic answer and not just. Now, with respect to the individuals, the tragedy of all of those individuals that are, have their expired statutes of limitations is that since they can't revive the criminal statute of limitations, they can't get their perpetrator in jail. But if you expect the perpetrators to have 100 to 150 victims, which is a kind of a modest assessment, then maybe you'll get victim number 92 to come forward. And all that evidence will have been reported to the police. They might have been out of statute, but as in the Bill Cosby case, they can still testify. So you can get them in jail. So you know, it took one woman to put Cosby in jail. It only takes one victim to put a perpetrator in jail. So, yeah. Well, 
they're fighting because <laughs> yeah, they have well, all the evidence. I know, but it seems like it would, it doesn't make any sense in many Protect cases. Protect the predators. Right. Right. Yeah, That's but I mean, well, you know, this maybe it's purely political to battle you fight. Like it used to be we used human witnesses and we no longer, new, we have records now rather than witnesses. Depending right. on the case. But, you know, the statute of limitations runs the gamut. So if you have a contract dispute, it can be very short. And the reason is because we want to know who has the rights under the contract and everybody can organize their financial dealings. There is no statute of limitations on murder. And so the question you ask is, well, where does the child sex abuse victim fit into that spectrum? It's my view that it's a lot closer to murder because the victim has, is so incapacitated from coming forward. And that's, by the way, why I do think that child sex abuse SOL issues are different from adult rape issues. So murder of innocence. Hmm? Murder of innocence. Murder of yeah there's or assault. Piece that I, especially when you're saying the criminal adjudication is limited, but yeah. the civil is not. So let's say that it goes to adjudication in the courts. Now you have a predator who's perhaps still within the system or right. outside who's a predator. The, the victim will get and hopefully the help or has been getting help all the time, but now you have running around in society people who may be now ousted from the system, excommunicated right. or whatever, running around the streets, they're not criminals. Right, that's right. And so what can be done? Because that's a very difficult situation. It's terrible. Um, because it really yeah. creates a different, it means now it's not gonna, it's not gonna be systemically possible, it's going to be more individually possible, right. and that, you said, is almost impossible to get your arms around. But in the era of the internet and the civil lawsuits, they get named. So, so, the, so the worst possible scenario is the statute of limitations expires, the institution throws them out into the public, and they go off and they abuse other groups of children. At least with a civil lawsuit, they're named publicly. It's, it's in the media, it's easily accessible. You can find a name, but you have to look for it, right? So the biggest problem for the church at this point, and for many of the religious organizations, is that they covered it up because of their own theology. It's, it's literal, the rule against scandal in the Catholic Church. It's a similar rule for Judaism. There's a similar rule in the Latter-day Saints. You can't let outsiders think badly of your religious organization, so you have to keep the secret. So they've got the secret, they let the guy out into the community, and then you discover the guy over here uh, at a children's hospital or you at an ice cream store. And that's why our biggest problem are the victims from the past. If we can unlock the information from the victims from the past, we can at least identify these individuals. But right now, with the statute of limitations shut down in many of the cases, there's just not much opportunity. I have a number of questions, but you talked about child rape kits. Yeah. I know what immediately came up with all the rape kits that have never been tested. Right, the backlog. Categorized. So maybe talk about that. I have a couple of other quick So uh, there'll be uh, an investigative report coming out from CNN next month. You didn't hear this from me. Um, but uh, we have analyzed 185 cases which they got through a FOIA request from multiple jurisdictions where a child comes in, they are tested, and then the local authorities destroy the rape kit. Forget, forget backlog. Uh, and by the way, if you destroy it after you have the report, that doesn't do you any good either because the courts will only accept the actual evidence, they will not accept the written report, the, the DNA report. So you need to preserve that rape kit. And especially for a child, especially in a state like Maryland where there's no statute of limitations, in many of the cases that we analyzed, they were destroying the rape kit 30, 40 years before the statute of limitations would expire. It was by far the best evidence that child would ever have they would be unlikely to be able to come forward until they're adults, 
And so essentially the system was basically flushing out their evidence. So, um, so we are instituting a study. Now, now we're doing a more FOIA data That's is random. Freedom of Information Act. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah Freedom of Information Have you run into Margaret McCann's sister, Margaret McCann, in the world? Yes, yes. She's great. Where does she stand on this? Because I, I, I know her through Plowshare Circles. You know. And I visited ODAT years yeah, ago. Yeah, she's really kept herself to the issues of the poor and, and other issues. She is not. If you step out right now in the church on my issues, yeah. you get censured. Well, um, I mean, she doesn't seem like somebody terribly bashful. But doesn't they take away your money? They take away your food and your housing. Oh so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I wanted to ask you your opinion on the Pope, the current <laughs> Pope, because it seems like the anti-gay movement is trying to unseat him. Right. It seems like there's been more progress since he came into power than before. But so. You know, institutions exist to perpetuate themselves, mm -hmm. and he has had a lot of words. Um, but he was uh, he was primarily responsible for getting a perpetrator out of jail in Argentina right before he became pope. It was a prolific pedophile. Um, he has a he has a history himself. He knows he does. Oh, he does. Not of abuse, oh. of covering up, of, of the cover up. up. Mm -hmm. um, but if you listen closely. Um, the, the church is as lawyerly as it is anything else. In fact, I've, I have a thesis that what's destroying the soul of most churches now are lawyers and listening to them. Um, <laughs> being a lawyer Instead yourself. of, yeah, being a lawyer myself. <laughs> and then not listening to this lawyer. Um, but um, the, uh, there is, thank you, there is a, uh, they say they've got zero tolerance, right? And they say that everyone should report suspected child abuse to the authorities and then everybody stops listening. And then they say, according to the law of the jurisdiction. They lobby all the time not to be mandated reporters. So they say you should report according to the law, and then in the background they create the law where they don't have to report. And then when you add to that the confessional exception, which they say that anything they learn through the confessional, they don't have to report, uh, they have all sorts of rules that continue to keep the secrets, and the Pope is at the head of the group that said, most recently in Ireland, we're gonna solve this problem with zero tolerance. You must report to the authorities according to what the law says. So until he says stop lobbying against the victims, he's no friend of the victims. Wow. This has been amazing. <laughs> Wait, Thank you. So much to think Anybody about. else have any? Yes, well, mainly family sex abuse among the Mormons. It's, it's largely family sex abuse in the Mormon faith. Can I interrupt you just for one second and give you a, a, a highlight note I just learned last week. The prophet of the Mormons said they're no longer to be called the Mormons yeah, yeah. or LDS, only the Church of Latter-day Saints. Which is why so I call it the Mormons they're trying to and the Latter-day Saints. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but just like they're trying to like not be the Mormons. <laughs> right, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> anyway, so sorry. I, I so, but all the fact that it's family reinforces my question, I guess, even more so. But if in yeshivas and all of that, that some people have, have, have been arguing, and, and it's, it has sounded sometimes uh, to make sense, that all the Catholic Church has to do is allow their priests to get married and have sex. And that will eliminate sexual abuse. Yeah. Right. But there are those who are saying yeah, no, no. And there's a big reason to and, and but Well, you know, the real expert and genius on celibacy and the effects of celibacy and what celibacy is meant for child sex abuse was Richard Seip, who who tragically passed away about a month ago. Um, he wrote on this when nobody was thinking about it. He was a monk and then he left the left being a monk, married a former nun and spent his entire career talking about this. But here's his thesis, and I think he's absolutely right. The reason that we didn't have the bishops telling us about child sex abuse is because the bishops were sleeping with either their housekeepers or their boyfriend. And so they were capable of being blackmailed. And so celibacy, the rule of celibacy, which says you can't have sex, means that if they were having sex, they were tainted, 
and therefore they couldn't talk about others having sex. And so that's part of what kept the cycle in the church. Um, and of course, we've just found out about McCarrick, which many of us have known for a very long time. McCarrick, of course, was, was uh, sexually approaching seminarians on a routine basis. And you know, there are plenty of bishops who go, would go to Thailand, and there are right. plenty who have housekeepers. Oh yeah, no, 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 it doesn't matter, it doesn't, but, but the question though is, where are the places in society that are most friendly to people who want to have sex with children, and for a long time it was, clergy was a pretty darn good place to be, right, you wanted your child Boy to Scouts be Boy Scouts were real. Boy Scouts was great, which Boy of course was in a church frequently, coaches, or a synagogue. Coaches, coaches, coaches. Right. Yeah, no, we're doing a study on the incidence of abuse and neglect among elite athletes, and I think we're going to find their rates are higher even. So, yeah, no, kids are at risk when they're alone. It seems it's got where, especially the child is coming into a situation where the adult, they are presented to the adult as the adult being a role model or having all this positive stuff around them, which, which makes the child even more vulnerable. Yeah. Yep. I think aloneness and vulnerability I do too, and my view is that if we can keep He's children right. from being alone with adults, but that that's shut clearly down a lot. that's clearly what it. Uh, Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.